Hey folks, Dr. Mike Isertel here for Renaissance Periodization with an interesting question. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Up until now, we as a society have prioritized very few resources to answer this incredibly important question. I suspect we should do the following. Genetically engineer woodchucks to be able to actually chuck wood. Keep them in giant matrix style farms where woodchucks are no longer born, they're grown. Where they no longer have woodchuck names, but merely woodchuck numbers. And find out how we can engineer them further to a robotic genetic combination perfection to chuck as much physical wood as possible. While we're working on that, however, let's talk about how to fix muscle asymmetries. Huge, huge question we get all the time. Let's dig into it. So first, there's actually two different kinds of muscle asymmetries in physique that we can talk about. There's non-bilateral aesthetic asymmetry. This is all aesthetic because we're not talking about strength and performance, just about how you look. Non-bilateral asymmetry means one muscle group, both sides of the body, is smaller than by comparison to another muscle group and or the rest of the muscles in the body. For example, your calves just too small for your hams and quads. People are like, ooh, your legs are huge. What the hell happened to your calves, right? The Omar Isuf problem. Ah, Omar, I'm just playing with you. I guess that's technically a critique that applies. So that's a thing. But if your calves are roughly equivalently sized, it's a problem that's relatively straightforward to bring up because, well, clearly you just try to train your calves as good as possible and maybe like train the other stuff a little bit less, something like that, all right? And if you're really curious about more detail on how to solve that problem, when both of your muscles on both sides of the body are behind some other muscle groups, we have a video called Growing Stubborn Body Parts. It's on the RP Strength or Renaissance Periodization YouTube and check that out. And it's got a tons, it's got an hour of information about how to get super, super detailed. However, what we're gonna talk about today is bilateral aesthetic asymmetry, which means one muscle is smaller than its mirror muscle on the other side of the body by enough to bother you. And it definitely means enough for you to notice. So like something like one bicep is notably bigger than the other. What do we do about that? That is the topic of today's video. Now, first question is why do these bilateral asymmetries even exist? We have a few culprits. Culprit number one is genetics. Right? Nobody's body is perfectly symmetrical. It's just the case. Right? They're pretty close, but nobody's perfect. Second thing, what does that mean nobody's perfectly symmetrical and why specifically? Well, sometimes one of the muscles on one side of the body has a bigger muscle belly than the other, just by genetics. Longer muscle fibers to make up that bigger muscle belly. More fibers physically packed in faster fibers, potentially even more satellite cells. So what ends up happening is not only does that fiber start out bigger, that muscle hole start out bigger, but it may even have a bigger growth potential and a bigger growth response. So that every time you train both biceps, one of them just started out bigger, some combination, gets bigger over training and has a bigger ceiling to how large it can get eventually with all of your efforts put in. That absolutely happens, one muscle to mu uh, muscles. Usually small difference, but muscles are not identical in any of those things. And sometimes the difference can be big enough to actually present themselves, right? Sometimes that's just for no good goddamn reason at all except luck of the draw, genetics, it just happens. Sometimes this actually occurs not because of genetics per se, but because it is to compensate for other genetics that are off or other developmental factors that are off. For example, if one of your legs is a little bit shorter than the other, one of your calves can actually get more daily use because it has to work more to close the distance to keep your gait looking normal. So in that case, sometimes, you know, one of your clavicles is a little shorter than the other, one of your, you know, your rib cage points a certain way, and all of a sudden, muscles, which even genetically could have started out identical, have different lifetime loading parameters and become differently sized and slightly different shaped in order to account for and fix skeletal asymmetries, which everyone has. Now, this is filed under some stuff of shit you can't do anything about. It's just going to happen. It's not your fault. You're not a morally, you know, irreconcilable person. It's just a thing that happens. Now, that's factor number one. Another factor is daily use. If you train a particular muscle very little, close to its minimum effective volume or something like that, 
whichever side of the body you use will usually be bigger because you train that side more because you train both sides minimally together and then adding the volume on top from daily use from that other side that you are essentially using more, you get more of a stimulative response, especially if the stuff you use it for is relatively high resistance. Like a mechanic who screws in, you know, various nuts and bolts with a big wrench, if he usually mostly uses his right hand or more than his left, you know, that's a high force activity and he probably doesn't use his left hand to even train with weights or maybe he does a little bit of weights. The left hand's gonna be, or left arm, uh, in, in Russian it's the same word, that's why I always mix up arm and hand. Um, the left arm will be like notably a little bit smaller, right? Because he just does a ton of this wrenching stuff, right? Insert your favorite arm preference masturbation joke right here, and lap it up uh, so we can get over and move on to the next thing, right? But that's fundamentally how that can happen. However, there's another way it can go. If you train both sides of your body to within your MEV MRV window, the optimum training amount, right? The, the, the amount of training that both sides get is within the gym already maxing out for growth. Whichever side you use more in daily life can be smaller, okay? How the hell is that possible? Well, that side is used more than the other side, which means it depletes its glycogen more, which means it's less anabolic at any one given time because how much glycogen you're storing has a direct link to how anabolic you are from any training stimulus, okay? So that's problem number one. Fiber conversion, especially for repeated use activities like stacking cups or something like that, that actually converts some of your fibers in that uh, arm or whatever leg that you're using more often to slower twitch variants that tend to grow less from any given set of training. So because you're already training to the max, any more activity that converts your fibers to slower twitch for that often used side ends up making the often used side not as big as the less often used side. Extra fatigue comes in. If you spent all day stacking up plates or something with your right arm, it's not going to perform as well as your left arm in the gym and training. So the training stimulus won't be as high. You have to have extra fatigue to recover from. So not only do you have to recover from training, you also have to recover from the fatigue of like stacking plates or whatever you're doing. That's a problem. There's only a maximum amount of recovery resources you have and they, all of the resources come from the same barrel, so to speak. So recovery spent from plate stacking is recovery you could have spent from training. And of course, the physical extra fatigue incurred during the process of training recovery. So for example, I'll use something that's you know, sort of near and dear to my heart. In Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I use, I don't know, it depends on for which move, but let's say I use my right hand a little bit more for passing when I'm passing around somebody's guard, right? I do an awesome session in which I train my arms and during Jiu-Jitsu a few hours later, my left side does mostly recovering. My right side, when it's supposed to be recovering and growing from training, is busy doing this bullshit guard passing and that at the time, not just for total fatigue, but at that recovery time interferes. So it is absolutely possible that if you're already training whatever muscles of the body very hard, what you could be doing is by doing more daily activity, you could be taking away from it, not adding, right? Now, point number three, or factor number three of how this asymmetry can happen is asymmetrical technique, right? Like you're benching off center or one arm strong on the other, and you're not fixing it. I'm not gonna address this anymore in this video because that's some shit you have to fix obvious how to fix it. Light, lighten up the weight, get a little further from failure, rework back in with perfect technique, okay? If your technique sucks and that's the reason you have an asymmetry, that is inexcusable, is the most obvious thing in the world to fix, right? So granted that's the case, maybe we'll figure out how to fix it, but before you try to fix it, you say, okay, damn it, one of my biceps is bigger than the other, one of my triceps, I gotta fix it. Before you try, let's figure out what exactly we're getting ourselves into and if we wanna fix it at all. So a couple of points here. Now, there's nothing wrong with fixing it, but just know the following. First, be sure that you care enough. Maybe you do, so fine. Make sure that others care if you're doing it for someone else. Usually, almost always, nobody can tell, okay? You folks have seen my physique plenty in all these videos or whatever. Which one of my biceps is bigger than the other? Which one, uh, what about calves? What about quads? What about pecs? Some of those I know distinctly. Uh, to be honest, for pecs, I have no idea, right? Jay Cutler, Mr. Olympia multiple times. Did you guys know that one of his arms was distinctly bigger than the other, especially biceps? Which one was it? You may, some combination of had no idea that that was the case and or don't remember which one it was, right? And maybe you do and you're like, yeah, okay, it was his left. I don't even remember which one it was, right? 
But the thing is, is that when people see Jay Cutler's physique, they're not like, this is an Olympia quality. Look at his arms, they're completely different size. Now, they were notably different size, but I bet you didn't notice. And even if you did, that motherfucker won the Olympia like four times. I mean, clearly, muscle asymmetries can't mean that big of a deal to anyone if people are walking on the Olympia stage and winning that shit with them, right? So before you think this is the worst thing in the world, because people will do that, I've done it. You look at your pecs and you're like, shit. Shit, my pecs are lopsided. Everyone can tell, everyone hates me. It's obvious I'm a clown. I can almost certainly promise you no one's ever given a shit. And even if they tried to give a shit, they're like, um, is it your right? You're like, no, it's my left. You're like, oh, okay, guess it's not a big deal. So make sure it's a big deal. Make sure it's notable, if you want. Number two, okay, just doing bilateral work tends to autocorrect most asymmetry if it ever even comes up especially like after an injury or something, one bicep smaller than the other. But here's the thing, if you do pull-ups, for example, or barbell curls, whichever bicep is smaller and weaker, if you position your hands equidistantly, has to do more work fractionally relative to its capacity. So you might be zero reps in reserve for this bicep that's weak, and the bicep that's big and strong, it's like three reps in reserve away or five. And you figure like it's just not getting pushed as hard, right? which means this per session just not gonna grow as much. So if you have two radically different muscles, one let's say got injured and the other didn't, if you just continue to do normal bilateral work and keep your balance and push just as hard with each side, the muscles that are weaker and behind are gonna catch up because they're getting relatively more challenged. So it's one of those things where if you're like, man, you know, ever since I hurt my leg a few months ago, my like left quad has been smaller than my right. I wouldn't worry about that sort of thing. Just do a good job with bilateral training and it usually just auto corrects, right? Why are we not worrying about it? Why not just fix it and take time to do it? Because of number three, you have to know what you're getting in to fix it. It's months of work, okay? And almost by definition, it has to cap the maximum potential of your stronger side, okay? There's no way in this world, and I'm very sorry, to bring your weaker side up to where your stronger side would be if you just maxed it out, okay? Almost by definition, especially if it's a genetic limit, like your, your bigger bicep is bigger due to genetics, there's no way to make your smaller bicep as big as your bigger bicep without limiting the potential of your bigger bicep. Because if you just let everything go and trained your bigger bicep, the one that's gifted a little bit more to its max, it by definition has better genetics, it would never allow the smaller one to catch up. So you have to automatically have some trade-off especially in time terms while you're fixing it, and even in eventual terms of how much do I value symmetry, perfect symmetry, versus maximum development. And if you're okay saying, okay, my pec will never get bigger than the left side pec, but at least they'll be the same size. That's totally cool. And of course, both pecs can grow over time, but there's gonna be a cap. So as long as you're okay with that, and as long as you're paying months of what we're gonna find out in a second, kind of meticulous training, if you're not okay with that, don't do this. Okay, and if you're okay with it, give it a shot, but know what you're getting yourself into. All right, how do you do it? It's actually a very straightforward process. First, you bring your bilateral work, the work for strong and weak side at the same time, down to maintenance volume or minimum effective volume. And if you wanna do this faster, bring it down to maintenance volume, which is very small, usually one third of the normal volume you do, something like that. Very tiny amount of volume, okay? So your bilateral work is like, a, you normally do three sets of bench during a workout, you could do, you're doing one set of bench. Or you normally do, you know, let's say six sets for pecs in any one workout, you're doing two sets for pecs, for both pecs, okay? If you wanna bring one up versus the other. Very, very small amount of volume, okay? Because if you train your bigger side through the normal volume landmarks, minimum effective volume to maximum recoverable, it's just gonna keep going on its own. It's like trying to catch up a slow train to a fast train and never slowing down the fast train. Uh, impossible. You can't you slow down the fast train because it's a couple miles ahead and speed up the slow train as much as possible. That's the only way it can work maximum efficiency. And the, uh, actually a pretty sweet analogy because maintenance volume is when your fast train stops and waits for the slow train to catch up. It means it's gonna catch up pretty soon. Minimum effective volume is like the fast train is still moving. And the fast train is still moving, that means like it's still gaining some distance. Now, of course, the slower train will catch up eventually, but like it's gonna take longer. So the more you still try to grow both sides, the more this is gonna take. And when I describe this next part, you're not gonna like the training and you're gonna think, hey, you should do this as fast as possible. So my humble recommendation is to put the strong side, or sorry, bilateral, both sides on maintenance volume. Okay, so maintenance volume for all bilateral movements, and then you're gonna take what's left, because it's maintenance volume for both, right? You're gonna take the weak side and you're gonna fill up its volume 
with unilateral movements, one arm at a time, one leg at a time, whatever, from MEV to MRV. Now, the thing is, don't blindly add a ton of volume because you could go over MRV, overreach that muscle group and get no gains with double the work. So just start a little bit above maintenance volume and slowly build volume, make sure you're recovering, make sure your strength is increasing, meso to meso to meso, do a good job, meet where of your MRV, when you reach it, deload and, and go down in volume, and meso after meso after meso, that's month after month after month of training, you're going to slowly gain and gain and gain in that weaker group. And remember, the stronger group is staying relatively stable. There is a cross-training effect where the stronger group might get a little bit bigger just because the nervous system communicates to both, crazy, I know but it's very small and it's not very prominent in very uh, well-trained muscles. So this muscle is gonna stay roughly the same size and this muscle is gonna slowly catch up, catch up, catch up, all right? That means a lot of this training is gonna be unilateral. How do you train your pecs unilaterally? Well, you go into the hammer strength machine and you hold one side of the chair and you do this. It's fucking annoying. It's not that fun. And then you have like a pretty big pump in this one pack and not a big one in the other and you're like, I just wanna even them out, but remember, this one's already bigger. So evening them out means like months of getting a pump pretty much only in the one pack that's weak. It's weird, right? My recommendation is to continue training like this until your weaker side is notably bigger than the stronger side, than the previously big side. Why? Well, because once you're done and you go back to normal training, that normal training means the smaller or the, the previously larger side was at maintenance volume for like four months. It's so sensitized to growth. And remember, also it has baller genetics to like grow a dot anyway. So, but this muscle group, the weak one that you just brought up, it's like pretty exhausted and not sensitized to growth. So of course, after you're done bringing it up, take a maintenance phase or a two week active rest phase for both of them, really make sure this one's fresh. And then when you go back to normal training, almost inevitably the previously stronger, now weaker side, the previously smaller, now bigger side, is gonna even the odds a little bit, okay? So I recommend not just getting up to here, but going overboard a little bit, so that you're like, wow, my weak pack, my small pack is now my big pack, great. Because when you go back to just normal training, your small, formerly bigger pack is gonna renorm and get real close, if not over, right? You want it to just come right up to normal, okay? That's what's gonna happen. So, what do you expect from this process? Normally, what are the expectations? First of all, it will take time. It's gonna take a block or two. So we're talking about three to five mesocycles, that is three to five, four to eight week training periods in each block. So we're talking about this takes like half a year to a year to really accomplish, even with a mild asymmetry, okay? That's a long time of not growing both muscles and training kind of in like a really, really weird way that usually is not that fun. So when I said earlier, like, make sure you're in and committed to this, that was a serious thing, right? Number two, okay, uh, and very related, you're going to be frustrated because you won't be able to train your, your, your favorite bilateral movement. Someone's like, hey, man, you squatting today? You're like, no. Like, what? What about leg press? No. What are you doing for legs? You're like, one-legged Smith machine chair squat and then one leg leg extension, one leg leg press. And someone's like, yeah, that's lame. And you're like, I know it's lame. I hate it. I want to train legs, legs, and I haven't done that for six months. That's what it takes to even those odds, right? That just has to happen. Here's another piece of not so great news. You have to be prepared to redo this on occasion. Why? If it's genetics that's causing the difference, the stronger side will occasionally outrun the weaker side because it's just better. All right, it's just inherently better growing muscle, so this is gonna keep rehappening, okay? If it's a daily use problem or daily use cause, it's also gonna happen, right? Uh, even if it's just short-term glycogen fatigue dynamics, it's gonna look like asymmetrical until you take a real break from daily activity and eat a bunch of carbs and then they're gonna more or less even out. But it you have to be prepared to read this on occasion. It is not a one-time fix. Now, it can fix for months and for years look very, very similar, but every now and again, you're gonna have to come back every few years probably and renorm those muscle groups. It stinks, but if you're really committed to symmetry, that may, is maybe what you have to do, right? And a little dose of reality. You can forget about maxing out your strong side gains. Like I want both pecs to be as big as my biggest one. Like yeah, in the short term, that's possible, but your biggest pec can get enormous potentially if you just let everything go and train at max. But your smaller pec will never be that big. So you have to be okay with being no bigger than your weakest side allows. Now, weakest side allows at its maximum genetic potential, which is still way bigger than you are right now. That's totally fine, but there's some give and take there, right? 
So you can still get bigger over time, absolutely, and get huge, but not untamed side big. Like imagine being like close to your genetic peak. You're like, you know, 39 years old and you're looking at your biceps in the mirror like, man, fuck. I just wish my smaller bicep was as big as my biggest one. Forget it. It's just not happening. It's not happening. That's what synthol is for. I have a website that sells, sells synthol. We got an easy number, 555 synthol. I, I know it's it's not the right number numbers, but it adds up. Call me. I answer the phone personally. We'll get you all the synthol you need. All right. So TLDR, what's the summary here? Asymmetry to some extent is very normal, very expected. And really honestly, folks, like I'm not blowing bullshit up your up your tail here. It's there's a super good chance only you notice it. Like I'm not like trying to kindergarten teacher you and being like you're special in your own way. No, you probably look like shit. You feel me just like me, JK. But honestly, it's legit something nobody notices, okay? Addressing it, if you want to, means slowing down overall gains for that muscle group. So make sure you're cool with that. If you do want to fix it, it's going to take some time and you have to overshoot your small side to weak side for a more longer term fix, which is still not super long term because it's going to happen again sooner or later. You got to readdress this problem occasionally. So... If you're cool with all that, okay, then you know how to fix it. But make sure you're cool with it. My recommendation is, especially if you're a beginner and intermediate, you have some small asymmetries, bro, don't even sweat. Just try to jack up your whole body, max that shit out, and then seven or 10 years of training in when you're jacked. Then when all of your muscles are growing pretty slowly, you can start to do more of a symmetrical approach. Because swear to God, if you weigh 120 pounds, nobody gives a God damn about which peck of yours is small. Motherfucker, I got solved problem. Both of them are small. So why don't you make both of them as big as they can? And then when you're like 165 and jacked, then you can be a little bit concerned with balance and mouth. My uh, personal advice to you. Folks, thanks for tuning in next time. If you want to buy stocks in the genetic engineering military application uh, woodchuck farm, again, call that same synthol number. It's my personal number. We'll talk.